Core Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, we're back at the library at Historic Fort Wayne and we're thankful to the Historic Fort Wayne Coalition for making this site available to us to shoot episodes. We also want to say thanks to our patrons, the CWDD Coffee Grinders. Patreon is a site where people can give a little bit of money each month and help defray the expenses that are creating a web series like this, allowing us to tell a wider story of the American in the Civil War. Today, historian Andrew Roscoe has joined us again. Andy, thanks for coming back. When we last had you, we had a story about Gettysburg. Where are we going today? So we're going to go back a little bit in time to the campaign before that for the Army of the Potomac and Army of Northern Virginia, the Chancellorsville campaign. And I want to talk about something that uh, is not really widely known, talking about specifically the Light Division in the Sixth Corps, as well as Hooker's Flying Column experiment that went on during this whole campaign. Okay, well, let's start. Hooker's Light Division. So the Light Division was really more of a brigade-sized group, but they took the best regiments in the Sixth Corps, and they grouped them together uh, starting in early February, right after Hooker takes command of the Army of the Potomac. And the idea for this is this is going to be a group that starts to do research on different ways of carrying equipment more lightly to be more mobile. And the idea is that they would be a fire brigade for the Army, that they could be rushed to a place of great emergency. Great. Who's behind this? So the real driving force, Hooker is definitely signing off on it, but his chief of staff, Daniel Butterfield, is the guy really driving this. As early as November of 62, he's writing to members of the administration saying that he wants to make the Army more mobile, more agile. He wants to cut down on their wagon train uses. He really wants to try to make the Army uh, reinvent the way the Army of the Potomac is fighting. Okay, well, Butterfield's known for writing what we now know as TAPS, and of course is very famous there. Talk to me a little bit about other things that he does as far as military text. So Dan Butterfield's interesting because he's not a West Pointer. He's a militia officer. But he writes what is the definitive outpost manual during the war. So pickets, grand guards, basically all of the little war that happens outside of battles. He writes this manual when he is in charge of the outpost during the siege of Yorktown in 1862. It gets published early in 63. And this, pretty much by the end of 63, is army-wide, is accepted as standard. You're saying across the Army of the Potomac? Across the entire United States Army. General Sherman had copies and distributed in the Army of Tennessee. General Thomas with the Army in the Cumberland. Hooker distributed to every brigade and division in the Army of the Potomac. This was widely used and widely acclaimed as one of the best little books of the war. Okay, great. So the fella can write and he's got some ideas. What's this idea? So the idea in general is that they're going to make the Army much more mobile by cutting down by the number of wagons following it. Okay, there are, now, hang on. You said the Army. We were talking about a brigade-sized yeah. division. Are we going further with this concept? Exactly. Creating the Light Division was a prototype, but it is an idea of how to eventually transform the entire Army. And the Chancellorsville campaign is kind of the first step towards it. In a lot of ways, it never really sees its full potential. Butterfield's idea is that they're going to cut down the number of wagons following the Army, and they're going to instead use mule trains. And because of this, they're going to have less baggage. They're going to have more stuff be carried by the individual soldiers. This concept he has, is this new? So no, this, uh, this actually comes out of when the French invaded Algeria in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, so Algeria was an Ottoman territory, and France ended up invading in the late 1830s. By 1841, they had conquered the coast, and they started to move inland. And uh, General Bugad, who's the French commander is now moving in this territory where there's no roads and he and he's dealing with this Berber cavalry that's very mobile. And so he decides he needs to make his forces mobile. So he creates this idea called the Flying Column. And eventually this idea is what allows the French to conquer Algeria. Fast forwarding 20 years to the Civil War, there's actually a French military equipment manufacturer who writes to the Quartermaster General of the Army, Montgomery Meigs, with a suggestion that the U.S. Army should adopt a similar system. Meigs writes to Hooker and Butterfield at the Army of the Potomac with some suggestions. And this leads to the genesis of and gives official Army sanction to this whole scheme for the Chancellorsville campaign. Well, then, great. Talk to me about how the Light Division is used in the first months of its life. So the first couple months of its life, it's actually getting used as a test bed. Uh, particularly Butterfield and Hooker put to them that they want a system put in place for men to be able to carry more than the standard three days ration without unduly burdening the soldiers. And after a month and a half long series of tests, what they come up with was an idea for eight days rations. 
Three days rations are still carried in the haversack as is normal for Civil War soldiers. The remaining five days are split with the majority of it being carried in the knapsack, and that's gonna be your hard bread, your salt, sugar, and coffee. And the protein is going to actually be beef on the hoof that is driven along with army. It will every day will be butchered and distributed out to the soldiers to supplement the salt pork carried in the haversack. Great. So the light division comes up with this idea. How does this figure into Chancellorsville? In early April of 63, Hooker mandates the entire army adopt this system. And further on this, they're going to reduce the number of wagons that follow the army in lieu of, increase, of introducing mule trains. And so instead of carrying ready ammunition in the wagons, now they're going to carry ready ammunition on mule trains. And this gets adopted right prior to the campaign, and it makes it that Chancellorsville is actually set on an eight-day schedule. Hooker knows that he has eight days where he is completely free to maneuver with no worry about supplies because he has somewhere of about 150 rounds of ammunition per soldier and eight days forage for his animals and eight days rations for his men. So he knows that he can fight several major engagements and move for eight days for this whole campaign. And it allows him to build his whole timetable around that. Okay, well that's the God on a battlefield, the bird's eye 10,000 foot view we might say today. What does this mean for the enlisted men? For the enlisted men, it means that they drastically have to, it requires really draconian enforcement of the march order from Hooker. Uh, Rufus Dawes, who's lieutenant colonel in the 6th Wisconsin, the Army Brigade, writes about that he had to order the officers in his regiment to inspect every man's knapsack, that they went through and made sure that they only, in accordance with the orders, only had one set of underclothes, so a shirt, underwear, socks, that they only had a great coat or a blanket, that they had a gum blanket, a shelter half, and the food, and that's it. He even writes about them confiscating playing cards and Bibles, which in the same sentence is rather interesting. Yes, given the 19th century view on the morality of playing cards. Great. So Chancellorsville, we know now, is a dreadful federal loss because of other reasons. As we look back, how, what do we learn? What was learned at the time from this experiment? So there's actually a fascinating discussion in the official records about this. Is Montgomery Meigs was interested in know how good this worked, and Rufus Ingalls, who's the quartermaster of the Army of the Potomac, actually solicits information from all the, the core quartermasters, and they he combines it together as one report which gets sent up. There's really interesting discussions about how this was put into effect and how the efficacy of it. Uh, it drastically cut down the number of wagons, which everyone agreed was good. What the Army was able to do is keep the wagon trains that were there further to the rear and just use mule teams to bring supplies up, which meant that behind the Army was much less congested, which allowed, which made it much easier to move troops from different parts of the battlefield. Andy, the role of the historian is to be hindsight 2020, and you have the advantage of both being a historian with 150 years to look at things and a current military officer. Using both of those lenses as you look back on this experiment, what went well and what could have been done better? So I think the idea was good. Obviously it had been proven before by the French on a much smaller scale. And I think that's where this was implemented very quickly and it really didn't have a chance to be tested in the field beforehand. The problem is that instead of using trained mule teams with trained mule operators, they just took mules from the individual wagon trains. They took two mules from each six mule team and just took men and told them, hey, you're going to be mule train operators. So they were never properly trained in how to load the mules and how to care for the mules. And a lot of the uh, quartermaster officers that are dealing with them weren't used to dealing with mule trains, so they didn't know to unpack them every day, to feed them, to care for them, which caused that the mule trains broke down by the end of the campaign. Which The other unfortunate aspect is that meant that the, wag the teams back with the wagons were reduced, and it reduced the carrying capacity of the wagons from about 2,500 pounds to 1,600 pounds. So there's some problems with the efficiency of the mules. However, everyone agreed that the ability to go cross-country was gave some really great opportunities to the Army that weren't there previously. So they saw the potential, and I think it would have been carried forward if Hooker had remained in command of the Army. But when he was replaced by George Meade in June 1863, uh, Meade seems to have shelved this whole idea and just kind of reverted to how things had been before. 
Well, great. Let's talk about the test bed. Talk about the light division. What happened? How were? The, what happened to these fellows of the Battle of Chancellorsville? So the light division never really got used the way it was supposed to. If you really imagine how they should have been used, they should have been leading that great flank march that happens to get behind Lee's left to get to Chancellorsville. Instead, they're used as part of the holding force right in front of Fredericksburg on the old battlefield from December. And unfortunately for them, they get used as shock troops when the 6th Corps finally gets ordered to take Marie's Heights. So they charge over the same field that the Union had lost so many troops in December the year before. But they successfully take the stone wall at Marie's Heights and allow the Union 6th Corps to push towards Chancellorsville. But in the process, they take devastating losses. The regiments uh, lose anywhere from a third to half their number. And within a month after the Battle of Chancellorsville, the division is broken up and they're returned to their original brigades and the whole concept dies out. Well, Andy, thanks for bringing the story. Again, as when we talked about the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg, we're looking at some more nuanced pieces of history. And thanks for bringing this little concept that was tried in the Army of the Potomac and telling us a lot more about it. Appreciate the time. Well, thank you very much for having me. And thank you for joining us at Civil War Digital Digest. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.